Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Christelle Fournel, the General Manager of the Retailing 4.0 Chair, and I'm very happy to be with you tonight for this 37th event organized by the Chair. So I'm with uh, Professor Olivier Bado, who is a full-time professor at ESCP, but also the Scientific Director of the Chair. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Elisabeth Denner, the president of the chair and uh, she, who is partner at Bering Point, couldn't be with us tonight. Um, but uh, still, it's going to be a, a very uh, wonderful event. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, all ESCP campuses and teams, especially the Italian one, but also the Bering Point Italian team uh, for the organization of, the, of this event. They were very involved, uh, in, involved in this organization. Before we start, uh, let me give you a few words about the ESCP Bearing Point Chair. It was created by Professor Olivier Bado about five years ago, and uh, the objective of this chair uh, was to um, work on the future of retailing, analyze the factors of mutation, uh, such as the digital env environment, the shopper behaviors, but also the impact of these mutations on the new formats, new te technologies in retail. So our objective is really to identify uh, credible scenarios for the future of the sector, test them and evaluate them. The chair was then uh, was firstly uh, supported by uh, the top uh, one French retailer who is uh, Edouard Leclerc. And now, since uh, 19, uh, nine, uh, 2019, uh, it is supported by uh, our um, uh, partner, Bearing Point, who is a very famous international consulting firm. Uh, they, are, they have a lot of uh, experts and consultants in many countries uh, in retail, and uh, we thank them again for their uh, wonderful contribution in all the activities of the chair, uh, such as research, of course, but also activities with students, students in uh, master in management, but also uh, students in specialized masters, uh, in PhDs, thesis, and so on. And of course, they collaborate a lot for uh, organization, organizing uh, such events as tonight. Um, now let's talk about this uh, topic and, uh, that we are going to uh, uh, have tonight. Uh, we are going to talk about the impact of COVID in retail, uh, on retail in Italy. And uh, to address with this topic, we um, invited the wonderful speakers we will first have uh, Dr. Isabella Maglioni. <laughs> she is a, a professor at ESCP. And then we will welcome Luca Mignini. Uh, she, he was former, the former chief uh, operating officer at Campbell Soup. And he is now professor at Bocconi University in management and innovation. And then we will have a consultant from Bering Point Italy, uh, Rabi Amdam. And uh, he will tell us about the, the, their ex the bearing points expertise uh, in retail in, in Italy. So now I will give the screen to, screen to Isabella. <laughs> Isabella, welcome. Thank you very much, Christelle. Thank you very much for the introduction. And also I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Olivier Biado for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure being here uh, today with you virtually, um, talking about the impact of COVID on, uh, um, on retail in Italy. So um, as uh, you said, Christelle, I'm a professor, associate professor of marketing at the Turin campus. And uh, my specialization is particularly in retail and consumer behavior. And uh, this evening, I actually would like to talk to take you through um, some of the changes that we are seeing in consumer behavior due to, due to the pandemic and also present you some frameworks that uh, in uh, uh, marketing and consumer behavior um, we use to interpret these changes. Uh, um, and at the same time, uh, I would like to present to you um, how retailers are coping with this situation and 
uh, which are the space of innovation in this. So, sorry, we have lost our speaker for a while, but she's uh, getting back, I think, uh, relaunching her laptop or computer. Hello, everyone. I think I'm back. I hope you can hear me now. Hello. Hello, back. I'm really sorry about that. I think my internet connection no dropped. Um, yes, <laughs> unfortunately, um, sometimes happens. So um, I was telling you that I'd like to take you through this journey and talking about about some changes in consumption behavior, but also talking about how retailers in Italy are coping with this situation, and particularly the, the way in which they are innovating um, with reference to these unprecedented challenge they are facing. But actually to kick off, I'd like to um, ask you to take a step back and uh, think about, uh, and travel in time and think about uh, our life pre-COVID. And by thinking about our life pre-COVID, I want to ask you a couple of questions about that. So what did you want at that time before COVID hit? Um, what were your needs? What did you crave for? And of course, many things are popping in your head um, and uh, keep them there because now I want you to travel back in time and bring your attention back where we are now during the COVID pandemic. And I want to ask you the same exact question. What are your needs now? What do you desire now? And at the same time, what do you crave for now? So of course you have several answers to this question. And uh, if we think about these answers, we can identify different motivations driving our needs, our consumer behavior. And these motivations can be ascribed to different areas um, that are depicted in this framework here, which represent uh, the different areas and the different type of motivations that drive consumer behavior. Our consumer beha consumer behavior is, can be driven by three different major types of motivation. The first ones are related to getting results. And so these type of needs deliver functional value. Then we have enjoyment. So having fun, all the motivations and consumption of motivations in this realm are about uh, obtaining leisure value. And in the end, we have the third realm, which is related to the ego, about feeling good with yourself, increasing your self-image, and also delivering this signaling value that can communicate your image, your self-image uh, to, to the society and also define yourself within the society. So the point I like to make here is the fact that we can easily place the different needs we were talking about at the beginning in one of these sphere or across many, more, more than one, so one or two. The point is that when a crisis hit, it doesn't really change the fundamental needs or consumer behavior, but what it changes is the silence of these specific needs. Some needs become uh, more important than others. And particularly we see a shift in consumer goals and our focus gets uh, becomes more basic and we are more focused on immediate needs and more basic needs. Another important aspect uh, when talking 
asking about consumer behavior and the impact of consumer behavior of a crisis is the role of emotions. And here I'm presenting you a framework that uh, um, maps all the different fluctuations of emotions uh, through the different stages of a disaster or a crisis. So we can see uh, major fluctuations across the different moments. And currently we can place ourselves around this point here, the let's say the anniversary reaction points, because it's been almost, a, well, it's been a year since uh, the pandemic hit. And the good news is that if we follow this model, the, the outlook looks quite positive because uh, our emotions are going to increase in the future. But um, the COVID-19 pandemic is quite particular because it's been, um, it has comprised several waves. And so these circle, um, has uh, repeated multiple times um, and uh, we hope that now we are at the point where with the vaccine campaign we will we will really see this positive outlook uh, uh, panning out over uh, the next few months but what happens uh, as a consequence of these major fluctuations we see in emotions well, at the very beginning, we saw some really irrational behavior from a consumer perspective. And this was mainly represented by the stockpiling and panic buying. And here we have a couple of examples from different areas in the world. The first picture is from Italy uh, in the supermarket, the pasta shelf. And this was actually a running joke at the time, because as you can see at the top of this shelf, there is only one type of pasta that was current, actually left on, on the shelf, and the running joke was that, uh, well, Italians don't really like penne liche. they actually bought everything else except that specific type of pasta. But this irrational behavior was also very common on the other side of the world, and I want to bring back memories from the famous uh, toilet, toilet paper fight in Australia, where we found people fighting over a toilet paper roll in supermarkets and stockpiling this, uh, this type of product. So the problem is that that was just the beginning. The effects of the lockdown and also social distancing have had a major impact on the entire society and particularly not just on the economy but also on our mental health. We went through different stages uh, starting from the disbelief, moving into anger, sadness, going into the acceptance and having some uh, spark of optimism when some of the restrictions were lifted for a limited uh, period of time. But these uh, fluctuations fluctuations in emotion have taken a major toll on mental health. And these numbers here are coming from uh, a recent research that we have run at the SCP. And where we asked people, how do, you, how do you feel, how they have felt in the prior, in two weeks prior uh, our survey. And it's uh, quite alarming that, uh, particularly among young people, the impact of the lockdown and social distancing has generated several issues from a psychological perspective. But generally also in Italy, what we see is that uh, the expectation of the consumer sentiment is still very low. Over a third of the people, of, of consumers we spoke to, expect to face uh, serious uh, financial problems in 2021. And 42% are expecting to actually reduce their spending significantly over the next few months. Uh, this has impacts on uh, consumer behavior. And uh, from uh, our research and research from also other institutes, uh, we have clearly identified three key trends. The first one is related to the online, this explosion of the online, and we're going to talk about, talk about it uh, a little bit more in a few moments. The other uh, driver, the other emerging trends is the idea of, is this idea of better value. Uh, what do I mean by better value? I'm not talking about looking at the lowest price, but I'm talking about um, an attention that our customers still have uh, with relation to quality and the origin of products. So our customers, particularly in Italy, um, are paying a lot of attention to quality and at the, at the same time at, uh, purchase, to purchase local products. But doing this, they also try to find the better deals within the specific sphere. The third theme is uh, uh, sustainability and ethicality. What we have seen 
during the pandemic is that many people, many more people have become more sensitive to uh, sustainable environmental issues, or at least they declare that. We haven't seen a clear shift with more, with definitely more people purchasing more sustainable products, but at least there is more sensitivity towards that. And clearly there is a, um, a more attention, a higher attention to um, social issues and uh, towards the common good. Uh, but our life currently is sort is a sort of life on all. So we are living in a sort of a bubble, and this means that we have deferred so many uh, different um, activities, projects, and also purchase decision. And here we have some insights into the type of product category that have been uh, deferred most, the most: uh, travel, of course, automotive, and also white goods. So. If we want to bring this all together into a framework, we can say that there are three different stages uh, that uh, we've been going through during this pandemic. At the very beginning, we have seen when uh, the pandemic hit, um, we saw the impact of uh, of the, the COVID-19, and so we observed stockpiling, low confidence, stress, anxiety, and this explosion in demand for grocery and also hygiene product. Then we move into the adaptation phase, and it's currently where we are at. We are almost towards the new normal, but not actually there. Um, so main points here, of course, uh, a lot of online shopping, uh, many interaction with social media and TV, uh, cancellation and deferral purchases, and more cooking, cleaning, and more attention to our personal health, more fitness, and focus on personal wellness. What's going to come next, uh, or at least we expect to come, is uh, this uh, um, phase that is called the new normal, where we do expect an increase in demand uh, for those products that were the host purchase was deferred uh, in the previous phases. Uh, a higher penetration of online, online is here to stay, uh, but at the same time, an increased focus on local because we have discovered so uh, many new shops and so many new opportunities that are very close, uh, close by and we're not going to leave them. And at the same time, an increased focus on home as a place for uh, stability uh, as a reference point. So our consumer is uh, now much more digital. I say much more digital because we have been talking about digitalization and digital consumer for over a decade now. So what the pandemic did was actually accelerating this process. And we have seen at least these numbers are from Italy, um, an, in, an increase in the e-commerce plus 26% and in mobile e-commerce plus 41%. And particularly many people started purchasing new products uh, for the first time. And it's interesting the phenomenon in grocery, uh, which was one of the product category that usually was purchased in a physical store. But during the pandemic, many, many people turned to the, to the um, online channel for the grocery shopping. So a recent study from the Polytechnic of Milano has also estimated that uh, uh, there has been an increase in investment in digital from retailers. And now at the moment, uh, it's uh, around 2% of the total revenue. So there is an increased investment. And where are our retailers in Italy investing and, of course, innovating in the digital space? Three key areas. Uh, the e-commerce acceleration, the omni-channel, and the data-driven personalized and short social experiences. So related to e-commerce acceleration, uh, we see, of course, retailers investing a lot in this space in a different way. Um, the major retailers are making made, uh, significant investments in improving their supply chain uh, and their fulfillment centers as well, and they are investing even more in their e-commerce infrastructures. And here we have some examples. For example, um, we do have uh, uh, Italy that has just relaunched um, and restarted their e-commerce website. L'Erbolario, which is a um, um, beauty retailer, uh, Italian beauty retailer, they re-entered the online channel um, with, uh, with a new website during the pandemic. But also fashion brands like Aspasi are uh, uh, investing in this space. And for example, Aspasi uh, stopped outsourcing the e-commerce and they internalize it and now they're managing it internally and is actually going uh, really well and they have declared an increase by 30% in volumes of their e-commerce after this move. 
Uh, on the other end, we have small and medium retailers that are approaching the online channel and they are experimenting with new touch points. And I want to bring you to your attention this example, the Vicinato shop, which is a marketplace of uh, small and independent retailers. And the idea um, of Vicinato shop is to replicate and mimic the a virtual square, a virtual high street where consumer can go and uh, uh, purchase from uh, their local and trusted um, stores that actually are all together in one marketplace um, presenting their offer uh, to the customers. Regarding to omnichannel, there is always this tension related to offering a seamless experience across different channels and different touch points. And particularly during the, the pandemic, we, we've seen uh, the rising of the click and collect home delivery and also live streaming. And here I have some examples in this sense. I have Gelateria uh, Marchetti that uh, um, is an ice cream uh, shop in, uh, uh, in Torino. And what they did was launching this new service that is called Video Bottega. And through a video call, you can get in touch with the sales associate in store, make do your purchases with them. Um, and at the same time, you can decide uh, either to pick up in store your shopping or have it delivered to your place. Um, another example uh, in this area is uh, a Feltrinelli Bookstore. They have launched a series of online events where they are um, creating these exclusive events related to uh, the purchase of specific products and you have the opportunity to meet the authors online virtually or also meet different artists in the online environment. Um, Motivi, is, uh, which is a fashion retailer, is experimenting in this space with uh, a new service that is bringing together shopping and entertainment, entertainment. And it's a platform where sales associates are actually entertaining the, um, the, the shoppers. Uh, and at the same time, they are presenting the collections and the new collection and you have the opportunity to purchase the product through the platform while the show is on. So this is really tapping into this new trend of bringing together the entertainment space with the shopping space. But also um, shopping centers and specifically fashion outlets are tapping into uh, this area. And uh, here we have the example of Scalo Milano a casa, which is a service that plays through um, WhatsApp and you can actually interact with the stores that uh, are uh, within uh, uh, Scalo Milano outlet, which is a fashion outlet next to, very close to Milan. And you can purchase product through WhatsApp and have your shopping still delivered at home, or you can go to Scalo Milano and pick it up. So what we can see here is that, of course, technology is everywhere, but technology is clearly an enabler of these experiences. We see an increasingly important element associated to humans. So the role of the sales associate, the role of the video call and the human touch. So we see technology enabling this type of experiences, but the key differentiator across these experiences is the human touch, the presence of the sales associate or uh, other people interacting with the customer in real time. This takes us to you know, the, the last area of innovation that I'd like to talk about today, which is the data-driven, personalized, and social. So we spoke about a little bit the social and virtual selling uh, just before with uh, Gerlateria Marchetti um, and also a little bit Motivi is doing that. Um, but there are also new companies entering this space and just offering this service to small retailer and independent retailers. And this is the case of uh, Shopcall, for example, which is a dedicated platform for, to, uh, for video calls and video shopping, for example. Another space is uh, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, we have several brands playing into this area. One example is Gucci that uh, through uh, their app, uh, you can actually try on, virtually try on uh, a new pair of shoes uh, that was launched uh, a few months ago. Uh, the beauty sector is working a lot in, um, in this space. Uh, recently, Chanel has launched a lip scanner. You can try on uh, using your mobile. You can try on all the different shades of uh, lipstick from Chanel. Um, Luxottica and uh, they, uh, the different retail chains uh, under Luxottica are trialing uh, these online service virtual try-on of uh, sunglasses and glasses. 
And also IKEA has developed this virtual store, virtual tour of their store. And you can wander around the virtual store um, and actually look at the different furniture and purchase them through the virtual store, um, leaving a sort of a virtual experience in an, Ike an IKEA store. But then we, we see new services like the beauty video call when you from Sephora, where you can have uh, dedicated and tailored support um, related to makeup and uh, different products, beauty products. But also uh, this uh, service that was launched by Elena Miro, fashion retailer in Italy, the shopping smart box, which is a service that sends to customers um, curated and a tailored box with a selection of pieces from the latest con collection. And then customers can decide if uh, they want to keep all the items of they or return some of them. So this idea is actually um, pulling together different elements of the customer experience and so the personal selling, the uh, tailored component and personalized component, and at the same time, the surprise element um, that uh, um, fits into uh, this new service. And it's been a huge success so far in the first month of release, more than 300 customers decided to uh, benefit from this service and try it. So, we, ha we, we have seen so far how Italian retailers have been innovating and of course many of these innovations are also developing around the world um, what i can say to conclude is that beside the crisis and you know this tough situation that retailers are facing this need for uh, experimenting and uh, improving and innovating did not decrease during the pandemic and this actually uh, shows how resilient uh, many retailers are and this is particularly true I think for the small independent retailers that are really embracing innovation right now and in Italy there are so many small independent retailers because our retailing sector is extremely fragmented and these small retailers are really embracing innovation to fight against this, the consequences of, of the pandemic. And I'd like to close with this quote from uh, Jeff Bezos, and it was sent to Amazon's employees uh, very recently. And this quote tells a lot about um, innovation and also the need uh, to keep innovating. And I think that you know, innovation delivers unique value. And at the same time, it opens up um, new, for new opportunities for competing, even in these hard times um, that we are actually living in. So with this thought, um, I would like to thank you and uh, uh, I'm going to leave the stage, uh, uh, our virtual stage, to our next speakers, Rabbi Hamdan and also Luca Mignini. From... So thank you very much. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, it was a brilliant presentation. I'm sure that Olivier he agrees with me <laughs> and I have particularly ap appreciated your relevant examples. Uh, Thank you, Christelle. So, <laughs> you're welcome. So now, uh, Rabi, are you yeah. ready? Yeah, absolutely. So instead of putting the spot up for the couple yeah. of slides. Yeah, if you can share the slides, please. Okay, perfect. Uh, Isabella, thanks a lot for, I mean, for your intervention and for the insights on the consumer behavior um, and also the consumer behaviors and how we're seeing the situation evolve in Italy. Um, I'd like to maybe start just quickly, very, very briefly, um, of our take of how COVID is reshuffling a little bit the cards, and then I would like to leave the time actually for the conversation with Luca, because I think that is where we can get quite a bit of insights um, beyond the obvious. Um, so. Excuse just one second. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so what what we actually have seen with the um, with the COVID, if we can start with that maybe, um, is a great compression. I mean, a lot of the trends that we have been seeing in, in, in retail and the innovation, actually, they've been ongoing for a number of years. And um, whether we're talking about e-commerce, whether we're talking about personalization, whether we're talking about you know the visual part, the role of the store, etc., 
all of these things actually were not born or were not you know, enabled or triggered by COVID. However, what did get triggered by COVID is what we're calling, what we're seeing is the great compression. Meaning that once digitalization and going online and e-commerce and unified commerce in many ways was a sort of competitive advantage for uh, many retailers and many players in the uh, fast moving consumer goods industry. It actually became during COVID a matter of survival, especially for a lot of the smaller players uh, in the field. And what we've seen during the uh, COVID pandemic, which is still ongoing, is basically the compression of that time where just about you know, 10 years of digital growth had to be actually for a lot of companies condensed and they had to create their operations from scratch in a matter of months. Um, that actually, we'll touch, we'll touch again on that one uh, in a little bit. Uh, the other thing that we have seen is actually during this pandemic, uh, it is actually COVID that became the chief, uh, you know, the chief innovation officer for a lot of the companies because it provoked basically a, a different reaction. Whilst we have seen that you know there are many trends that were already actually quite obvious and they were moving forward, it has accelerated uh, at a huge pace uh, some trends. It has also, on the other hand, basically reshaped some of the trends and some new things basically bubbled up and came to the surface. Um, but it was a little bit you know outside of the control of the companies, which became basically much more in a reactive mode to what was happening uh, on the ground. For instance, a lot of these trends basically uh, that we're talking about and that are driven by innovation and are driven also by the change of consumer behavior. Uh, again, these are more obvious ones. I mean, we have been seeing them for a number of years. What happened though, actually during COVID, is the reshuffling of the cards. So you have certain things that came back to the surface that did not necessarily exist before. Let me just maybe spend a few words on some of them. Uh, the concept of safety first. The concept of safety first uh, prior to COVID was not really something completely relevant or something really relevant. Uh, indeed, you know, we were already talking about what's the role of the store and what's the combination between the online and offline. Should the store become a showroom? Should the store become more pick up, pick and collect, or whatever? But now that even that kind of thing thinking actually got reshuffled. Because with safety first, what we do anticipate is there will be a number of shoppers, a number of consumers, basically, that will also still have some kind of hesitance and reluctance to go to the stores. Um, so that brings a new twist to it. Also, in terms of you know the, some of the thinking around the store and the store of the future, um, now with work from home, even something like work from home can have an impact on it. Because for a lot of the uh, people in, in, in our society, uh, also in Italy, basically, that will be working more from home going out of your home actually in order to buy whether it's your grocery or do your shopping can become some kind of an outlet you know how do you leave that kind of a routine environment in order to go and explore something something different which will have basically an impact on the urban footprint of a lot of the uh, brands retailers and how they are distributed around the city but also around the geography um, you know in, in the country so we see basically that there are more tensions that are being created by COVID in addition to what we have talked about in terms of the, the uh, great compression. Uh, on top of that, what we actually uh, see basically is the rise of some of the some of the trends, basically. So let's maybe spend a little bit of time on contactless. Contactless commerce. Now, contactless commerce was not necessarily a, a new thing. It was already a trend that had been engaged for some time, but for certain players only. Um, and when we talk about contactless uh, commerce, we're not talking just about payment. But what we have seen now, actually, based on COVID, is the acceleration of that and the spread of that for a number of uh, companies, basically, where the estimations that the majority, let's say, of company from ordering replenishment as well as the payment part, uh, be it in store as well as online, will be basically a connected, um, a connected experience and will be done in an automated way. Uh, another thing that actually, another trend that just uh, came out of the COVID crisis is uh, the turning of the tables. Um, whilst the experience was controlled by the brands before, whether in the store or online, or to a certain extent by some influencers, um, what we've seen is a new phenomenon. Uh, the new phenomenon represented, for instance, by uh, startups like Shop Shops, where the, basically the shoppers are just live streaming their experience shopping. You know, and that becomes almost like an online TV in a continuous way, 
where people got hooked on just watching other people do their shopping. Um, that basically creates, to a certain extent, some kind of an opportunity, but it also creates quite a bit of you know, uh, threats and things to consider and challenges because you're no longer, as a retailer or as a brand, basically control your experience or your narrative online. It goes a little bit out of hand. Um, another thing that we saw basically uh, taking center stage also is the whole part on visual selling. So visual selling, um, it's not new basically uh, that for most shoppers, the, the, the visual experience, the number, whether it's number of images or seeing the product uh, that you are actually about to purchase or that you're interested in, is one of the most influential factors in that buying decision. Um, however, the, the, let's say, that visual selling component was not that much present uh, online. Uh, if you think, for instance, on Amazon, um, you typically have about eight images that you can actually put online but the average images that a seller is putting online is about three. Uh, and that's how they have underestimated, or companies have underestimated to date, the importance of that visual selling. And this is actually changing and turning completely tables because now the experience with your product, at least from a visual perspective, need to be shifted completely online. And that's another trend that we're seeing basically moving uh, quite, uh, quite strongly. Um, another trend, enterprise marketplace. Uh, yes, indeed, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, Isabella, for instance, e-commerce has boomed during the COVID. But what has boomed even more is enterprise uh, enterprise marketplaces. And again, enterprise marketplaces were not new. What has become a little bit different is the number of enterprise marketplaces, the number of specialized enterprise marketplaces, and for that matter, the number of B2B marketplaces. Because marketplaces prior to COVID were essentially a matter of companies trying to reach uh, consumers, but now we're seeing more, uh, let's say, or new business models where even B2B companies now need to access directly um, their uh, their consumers online. Um, so just a quick snapshot, basically, of some of the trends that we're seeing basically moving forward um, based on the pandemic. Now, as we said, COVID in the last year, year and a half, for a lot of companies has been the chief innovation officer. Uh, having said that, what does that mean for the chief operating office? Uh, because I think that is going to be the, the real question moving forward. And with me today to talk, to talk about this topic is Luca Vignini. Luca, Hi. welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks to you and thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. So, Luca, I'd like to maybe start with a, uh, a quick question for you. Um, and maybe let me just go back to one of the points that we had mentioned so earlier on, on the Great Depression. Uh, I'm just going to set the scene and I'll let you basically uh, Sorry, play with the answer you. which I mentioned one thing. So when we talk about the Great Compression, um, essentially a lot of companies or most companies that were not necessarily digitally equipped in order to go online uh, did a lot of their operations, changed a lot of their operations in a very quick time frame basically to go online. And that was a lifeline for them. Uh, uh, yeah, true. Without that, basically, they wouldn't have an access to consumers. Having said that, once that first hype basically passes, um, a number of questions will, will appear. I mean, uh, maybe just to set the scene with a few, few, few dimensions, a few food for thought, let's put it this way. Um, when you go online, essentially, in any brand, any retailer, everyone is competing with Amazon, whether you're selling your products on Amazon or not. Because essentially, what is setting the experience, what's setting the expectation of consumers, it are the likes of Amazon. So they're taking it to another level. Uh, same things, you know, you no longer control uh, the, the, the experience that you have. Something like post purchases, delivery, was not necessarily something that was related to the retailer, but now it is perceived as part of the business of the retailer. If I buy something online, uh, and if it doesn't arrive, I expect that if I call the brand that they can answer and not tell me it's the HL. Or Costa Italiani. Um, so there's a number of things that come into play basically due to this uh, great compression. And maybe before I pass through the ball, I just want to have a, um, a metaphor um, for this, more like a sports metaphor. Uh, so in basketball, um, you can basically get on board a star player, one star player, and with that star player, you can change the facet of your franchise. 
you can become a winning team, you can be quite successful. Um, last dance. Last dance. Last dance is a perfect example of that. Uh, in football, however, that's not the case. You can get a star player, but that star player is not necessarily going to change the facet of the game because you still have to do a number of passes before you reach that, that, that goal. So essentially, in football, you know, you're only as good as the weakest player. And I think e-commerce also is very similar. E-commerce is football in that sense. You know, you, you, you're only as good as the weakest part of your customer experience online. Exactly. So with your experience of, of, of chief operating officer uh, and your experience in the industry, what's your take on this great impression and what does this mean for a lot of companies and how should they dabble with it? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, if I had a perfect answer, I'd be, you know, probably in a 150-foot um, yacht right now, uh, enjoying the sun. But uh, first of all, uh, this uh, I, I fully agree with the great compression, and this is impacting. You know, we're talking about retailer, but this is impacting the whole system because uh, you have the need of survival in many cases, and uh, you got a huge um, elephant in the room, which is Amazon, which is setting the standard. And you have companies that to try to survive, they kind of get to the e-commerce, but you know, without having the right capabilities most of the time. Yeah. And so the question is that, and I think you know, we see that more and more. In the short run, somehow you have certain results which are better than nothing. So people are saying, okay, you know, things are moving on. But the reality is that you're gonna get uh, to a certain uh, threshold where a company will need to kind of look back and figure out how they're gonna create their own system. And what does it mean? Uh, it means that, for example, um, you know, when you look at a uh, retailer, if they want to compete against Amazon, Amazon at this point in time, really, they have perfect logistics. I mean, you know, Amazon is probably the best logistics, logistics ever. Uh, they tend to uh, push their own brands. You know, that's, right. that, that's their uh, agenda. Uh, and basically, they give you a suggested list, which is you know this, this huge fight about how I get in this in this list to survive. I believe uh, there is a huge opportunities um, with a number of trends that we see. Let's take one. You know, I used to work in food in several years, uh, and with uh, for example, especially for Italy, with aging population, there is this huge possibility to integrate a physical product that can be, you know, pasta can be anything else with a, uh, a personalized integration with the consumer needs uh, much, much wider than the specific pasta. As an example, you are a severe person, you got a problem, and you need to have a certain diet which includes gluten-free products. So if uh, the retailer is able to connect with consumer, being able to be a kind of a, uh, expert in helping the consumer to navigate through all uh, you know, the huge amount of, of items, then I think can be can be a massive advantage for those people. So you're moving, I think, you know, in terms of uh, the gamble or the survival, uh, more if you want to compete, you know, successfully, definitely you're not going to get the scale of Amazon. Even uh, even uh, you know with the formation of uh, the marketplace and everything, I mean, that's the driver of that thing. I'm going to be more on a, you know on other benefits which are you know sustainability or you know, you know people want to stay there. It's kind of different benefits, uh, but. I believe, you know, unless you get out of the, I got the product tomorrow at the best possible price, and that's it. If you don't have more currency, then you're gonna get a huge struggle from many, uh, from many of both the suppliers and retailers. That's an interesting point, actually, that you raise, uh, Luca, because I mean, one, what you say is beyond the hype in the beginning and getting some results. Uh, the, the companies still need to figure things out. Absolutely. Uh, which I think also, you know, from, from the culture and from a people perspective, like capabilities, I think I would imagine that most companies didn't have that. Look, I mean, Italy, as, as, uh, as we, all, we all know, I mean, the strength of Italy is really small, medium enterprises, mostly family owned company. Uh, so I think, you know, if you can imagine, most of the company right now are still run by, uh, you know, uh, the, the generation before mine. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of companies that are still run by the generation that. Uh, you know, my parents basically, uh, and so uh, for these people just to have a presence in the in the internet is something you know which is uh, obviously difficult to fully understand. So I think that the big transition is going to be how can you get the right capabilities, uh, you know, 
making sure that the owners or uh, you know the stakeholders at the highest level understand what the need is. I think in Italy we're going to get this challenge in mm -hmm. many areas, and uh, you know as was mentioned before, we got a huge polarization of retailers, and so there's going to be a, you know some significant shakeout on that area because uh, it's a, it's a culture, but then you use capabilities, processes. There is a lot of, I mean, you know, there is a lot of things that have to happen to make sure that this great compression that came out of need is going to become an opportunity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Especially if they're able to compete with some of the digital native players, which absolutely. actually have that as an innate. You touched on another point, Luca, that is, that is also interesting, uh, and it's an interesting angle to it, where you're saying, yes, you need to get the, the let's say, the basics right, and the basics already could be a challenge for many, actually, during this great compression. Which is get your delivery right, get your presence, get your customer experience right. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I understand also from your question is that there's going to be a need for differentiation yeah. uh, because going online, I would assume, you know, the lower the barriers for entry online are low. Uh, so when you are online, actually, you're competing with many more than what you were, you know, players that were you were competing before. Uh, the supply is increased also, so the capacity for creating that competitive advantage, if you want to go back to the previous thing, is actually much harder. Um, so, and a product online is a product online. Of course, you'll have the brand loyalty, and you will have, uh, uh, you know, uh, certain people that are fans of your products. But will that be sufficient, or am I understanding that you actually probably need to go into different areas in order to also? Yeah, I think you know, it's. Um, I don't know how we want to call it, but I would say that you're going to be moving from a single supplier of product to a product which integrates. A number of services which are valuable for consumers, and you know, in terms of perception, obviously, uh, just uh, you know, how how you connect to consumer. I mean, how you communicate. I mean, the, the online is democratizing a lot of uh, you know uh, the understanding of pricing and you know the the, the start in terms of how quickly you can get. But if you can, um, for example, again uh, provide services which are specific, it's a kind of mass customization. Mm -hmm. To you, probably that you know you're uh, you do a lot of sports and you kind of get a number of uh, needs that are specific to you. Now, how you get those inputs with those kind of potential supplies? That's going to be the challenge. So, how do you relate to those things? And and I think you know one of the key uh, factors, for example, which is impacting uh, the food system is transparency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people want to know what's inside the food. Okay. And uh, you know, but nobody is willing to go through the regulation because most of what is written in the in the packaging sometimes is absolutely impossible to understand. Yeah. And now you got enough, for example, to understand what's inside your food in many cases. But what about being upfront and you know, kind of a, a pushing certain kind of communication to differentiate your, let's say, your retailer that is going to specialize on whatever it is. And, uh, and, the, and the consumer is going to have an incentive to give you certain level of information. It's really the, the difficult piece is how you're going to do it transparently because everybody knows that you are the product. I mean, people are getting now aware of the fact that if you don't pay for something, it's because you are the product. Yeah. And, and I believe, you know, the challenge for many of those uh, retailers is going to be how they can they get this level of proximity with consumer so that it's not just that the brand you get that glass tomorrow morning, you know, and you pay X. But you know, what else I can get out of the service that can allow me to to do other things and not just to have the glass as a function of benefit. You know, we're talking about there are the way to get the three three uh, three type of benefit. I would say the function of benefit is the is the performance of the product. Then you have a number of uh, ended benefits which are more emotional or more linked to your kind of uh, uh, Feelings, if you wish, no. Mm -hmm. And unless you do that, how do you compete with somebody that is a million times your size? Yeah. So that differentiation actually, you see, is going to come from the storytelling and the narrative that you're going to be able to create, and that is based, if I understand you well, on how well can you connect, not just uh, to the minds of your consumers, but to the emotions of their consumers. I, I think you know, if, because you're competing against the monster. I mean, you know, like, and we can discuss. If it's right, if it's wrong, if there's a dominance position, whatever. But the idea is that you know you you get used to this kind of immediate gratification. Yeah. You know, and and the other piece is that you know again, as I was mentioning before, we got a huge gap. I mean, especially in Italy, uh, you know, of uh, capabilities 
to be able to do that. Because, I mean, right now, all we are doing, most of companies are saying, okay, you know, we sell glasses. Jesus, you know, uh, we don't know what's happening with COVID. We put it online. And so we have now a system that the person can order the glass online. Okay, check. So we were selling one glass last year, and now we are selling five glasses. Phenomenal. Now, the company is selling 10,000 glasses, and probably now the company is going down to 5,000. Yeah. And maybe you increase by four times what you sell online, but still there is a huge gap. So I think those kind of, uh, of, of uh, trends, they're going to cross each other at a certain point, and you're going to be seeing you know, a uh, big impact on, on also on the retailers, because the margins on retail uh, you know, are pretty low. And don't forget that Amazon is making a lot of money on the, with the cloud services and everything. So yeah. Amazon is not just you know, distributing, if they are providing a lot of other services when they make sense. Absolutely, and, and, and I think your point, I mean, uh, beyond the big players, I mean, uh, competition online is coming from everywhere, whether you're talking about fashion, whether you're talking about apparel, anything in fact, you know, consumer basically online. So the differentiation needs to come from different places. I, I, I like also the, the example that you used earlier, which is a little bit how can you use your product and add a service to it in order to accomplish the job done that the consumer wants to do. So it's no longer about the functional need of the product. It's not only about that. Exactly, it's not only, it's not, it's not only about that. It's it, how can you service the rest of the need that they want. Yeah. Um, we're seeing explosion, for instance, in fitness um, during COVID. Yeah. So can that be linked to, you know, when you're buying apparel, you can get also the service around the fitness and what you can do with it and the personalization. Similarly to food. So, but I do see, look, you know, I, I, I mean, that's maybe is my take on Italy, obviously. You know, Italy is one of the few countries where food has really a kind of a social, cultural, and emotional meaning. You know, uh, different from any other market. I mean, I've been living many years in the US. Uh, in Italy, you know, if somebody, if somebody who's a friend called you at nine o'clock at evening and say, you know, I'm coming for dinner, you say, fine, that's kind of almost business as usual. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen in other places because the eating is really part of a relationship, it's part of, you know, the way we live for. Uh, so, for example, I believe Italy has a huge opportunity in terms of pushing this marketplace, you know, putting together, uh, the, sh the store that you know, where you have an emotional connection, uh, because then you have a significant higher level of currency, uh, yeah. you know, that, that, that this place can leverage. And I think, you know, that to me is one of the key differentiation factors uh, that in this place, which is very narrow, very long, and very poorly, you know, organized, unfortunately, uh, that we can have, you know, certain specific opportunity. Uh, because normally in many other markets that's not so I'm strong. You may have it maybe in France, in certain area, or maybe in certain area of China, where you have like, the community uh, is much much bigger in terms of connection. But I mean, you know, you cannot compete on on the same kind. I, I call it currency or the same kind of variables because yeah. the catch up is pretty much complicated. So innovation in many ways, we're seeing a lot of innovation, but the innovation is yet to come actually in order to that will both with that great compression, building your capabilities, but at the same time building your value proposition online yeah. in a different way, well and beyond the product. Um, Absolutely, and I agree with what was said before, you know, COVID has not really changed the needs of a uh, of consumer. What has changed is the condition under which those needs have to be fulfilled. Yeah with more emphasis on certain area more than other, you know, uh, so uh, the saliency of certain characteristics are becoming high, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, if that played well, that can be an opportunity, but I mean, it's, it's probably a completely different business model. Also, how you organize the company, uh, how you structure internally the capabilities, uh, and to do that, I think, you know, this new, the new generation has to take, if you wish, uh, you know, a higher level of power inside the, the organization. I think that's, uh, that's let's say, let's call it the brutal truth. It's not brutal, but it's yeah. just a matter of reality. You've got people that are, you know, I teach at Bocconi where, you know, it's, it's fun for me because I, I, I get to, to teach to people that are 21, 22, are fully digital, and it's kind of reverse mentoring sometimes. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. And I think that's, you know, that's what should happen also in companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's probably actually going to be one of the... the Excuse the me. No, 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 go ahead. But look at Rabbi, either, or Isabella, I had a question. Uh, have you seen a difference in terms of uh, shopper behaviors or retailer strategies or adaptations between the north of Italy and the south of Italy? 
or not? Uh, there is, look, uh, I, you know, it's, I, it's funny. I mean, first of all, I'm an Italian who's getting a cultural shock in coming back to Italy after almost 30 years of living abroad. So I'm going through already the first, uh, the first shock wave. But uh, the the reality is that you know, if you look just technically, North is much more organized, what we call uh, distribution organizata or organized trade, and the South is still pretty much uh, wholesaling and small shop. Even though you have significant presence of supermarkets. I believe the opportunity we talk about in terms of uh, um, uh, differentiating are pretty much you know, consistent in both areas. The challenge is how you get the resources and the capabilities mm. uh, you know, to do so. And I believe, uh, you know, to be honest, I mean, I come from uh, the center, but I mean, I, I'm pretty familiar with both sides of the equation. Clearly, in the South, we're going to have a higher level of struggle because, on one side, because we have less structured uh, way of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other side, I can tell you that, you know, in the South, there can be the opportunity to be much more creative because, again, the level of, uh, of uh, um, legacy that is there is, is very strong. And so I think, you know, uh, opportunity absolutely is on both sides with different level of uh, probably difficulty in terms of implementation. For that matter, actually, Olivier also really complement what Luca is saying. At least what, what, what we're starting to see is, as, as a retailer or as a player in the fast moving consumer goods uh, industry in Italy, you almost need to have uh, you know, multiple strategies, sometimes according to the region or you know, uh, even to some of the urban centers. Uh, because in Italy, that, that kind of geography uh, is quite important in, in, in the, you know, the sense of belonging and the sense of how do I do things in each region is is, is quite it, it's quite different from one place to another. I mean, it is the case uh, almost everywhere around the world. Uh, however, it's particularly present in in, in Italy, which adds another. Dimension. But what's striking here is that you know, if you take US, obviously, uh, you understand that California is not the same thing than uh, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. uh, but the size and the distance is massive. In Italy, you may have big changes in, in 50 kilometers, you know, this distance. So it's, it's kind of a, it's like a patchwork. It really, really is, is an amazing patchwork of, uh, of things. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know, what I was trying to say poorly is that you need to figure out different ways than price and distribution time to be able to survive if you want to have mm. a, a connection. Because at the end of the day, you know, the brand value to me is the, the value of the long-term relationship that the brand is able to build with the consumers. Mm -hmm. Being those, the kind of consumer, being those in the to be with your, you know, uh, the company you're selling, but it's that long-term relationship that needs to be kept alive through innovation, renovation, and through, you know, adding relevant benefit, through coming with a disrupting product. You know, the disrupting product cannot be always the solution because, I mean, you know, most of the time you don't need that. Maybe you need, to make sure that people understand different way of using certain things, for example, or potential benefit they were not aware of. So, you know, I think that's that's uh, that's a possibility. And I have another question about the uh, geographic dimension. In France, we we discovered that during the pandemic, the, the the demand for short channels and local products was increased. And I guess that in Italy it was already important in terms of what we call the industrial districts and so on, local products or channels. Uh, has it increased as well or during the pandemic or, or not? Yeah, look, I, I don't have the data, but let me tell you something as an example, you know. Uh, as you know, COVID, one of the key requirements is about distancing, right? You have to be distant from, from other people because that. Now, you have area in Italy where distancing is impossible. Mm -hmm. So, as an example, the area of Naples, area of Palermo, where basically people are kept shopping in the same shop because they, you know, this is basically inside the house. They go downstairs and maybe they live, you know, there are three families living in the same place. Mm -hmm. So, the, 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 the paradox is that, you know, obviously, especially in the north, there has been this problem effect, but in some other area, you know, it's not that people were completely stupid or, or were not respecting the rules. Because we, we do have also that cases, but in some cases, financially and you know physically impossible to change your habits because there's no other way to survive. Mm 
Yeah, mm -hmm. no, no, that's absolutely true. Okay. Uh, now, if we look at it from a different angle, though, uh, from more in the northern areas, this is also linked to the geography and to, to your point also in the, on the northern side. Uh, what 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 did what we did observe, uh, let's say, during the, the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. is um, this rediscovery, let's say, of local products or proximity products, yeah. uh, of proximity stores. Uh, let's remember also that you, during lockdown, you can only go out for an X amount of time in order to get your groceries, um, which means that a lot of people took that occasion or that excuse in order to go out. So people rediscovered the local butcher, they discovered the local fruit and vegetables, or the, uh, and I think that reconnected yeah. uh, a lot of the consumers to a lot of the proximity stores, but also to the local produce and the local producers. Mm -hmm. And I think that will continue. And to, to your point, uh, well, I mean, we don't have an answer for that, but we believe even the, the rise of the enterprise marketplace, let's take that as an example, uh, is gonna actually try to continue the strength because once you start having even, you know, your local, let's say, proximity stores, your local produce on an enterprise marketplace, you know, where the payment is seamless, the delivery is seamless, and you can almost get that supermarket experience, but you're getting it from, you know, just your mom's and pop's shop. That is going to be actually a, a, a completely different phenomenon that will reshuffle the cards. It will even reshuffle the cards, uh, you know, uh, potentially for some of the big retail chains. You know? Why would I go to Carrefour if I can actually get the local produce, probably at a similar price, but directly from my proximity stores? So it always have a different, uh, you know, facets of that, and, and it's going to be fascinating to see how this is going to uh, this is going to evolve. And there is another piece which I think you know this country is surprising for me too, being Italian, which is you know a little bit of a paradox, but definitely there has been a, a a massive increase of solidarity among people. You know, while before, you know, I mean the fact of uh, the the small shop going down the drain. Yes, okay, maybe you knew the guy, but I mean it was. Now it's kind of a, it, you know, you think about it because you have a lot of people in the same condition. And so if you can help somebody, you know, doing maybe, okay, maybe the prosciutto is going to be cheaper somewhere else, but you know, it's like 50 cents or whatever, let's go there. Uh, I mean, I've been going to restaurants, you know, where I was not going really to kind of, uh, you know, try to keep these people afloat because I knew that maybe it was not my favorite restaurant to say, okay, you know, let's, let's, and I, I've been hearing this from people who can obviously spend some money many, many times. So I think that COVID thing, by the way, is, is giving those kind of marketplace and you know, kind of smaller retailer a chance, a bigger chance to survive in that sense. Uh, because I mean, has kind of taken out again those relationship, those kind of, you know, Solidarity thing that in this country is very is very strong. I mean, incredible enough, I was surprised myself. But I don't know what the data is saying because I, I haven't seen it. But I think you know, I'm curious to see what's going to happen. If uh, those people are going to keep themselves alive, uh, I think you know the big guys uh, will have to to to, to cope yeah. with that reality. Yeah, absolutely. New reality. I agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, look at uh, another thing. I mean, also what, what COVID has done. I mean, there's a boost in innovation, and you said you know COVID has boosted that. Let's say, and, and maybe it's not necessarily some things that are new, but it's just a different use for it, or it's new for the companies that are implementing it, with the retailers or uh, the players that are uh, that are putting it in place. But we will still have some tension because there are certain specificities for Italy, which let's take aging, for instance. Italy still has one of the you know oldest let's say um, population or percentage of seniors in, in, in this country. So whilst you know we've seen a lot of focus from a lot of companies basically on the new trends, what is that going to mean actually for the other segment of the market, which is particularly developed in in, in, in Italy? Look, I mean, absolutely, the aging piece is going to impact the type of cuts that a lot of company you know kind of area segment vertical that one out. I mean, you know, one, uh, I mean, it's a stupid example, one key element that came out out of this pandemic is that there is nobody really able to offer, for example, elderly people as a service to keep themselves alive during a pandemic like this. I mean, there's nothing, you know, I mean, the, 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 uh, 
the local support in terms of uh, uh, medics and so on was was not enough. And so I think you know, in terms of opportunity, the pandemics actually is is creating a lot of those new things that before have never been uh, considered. Now, one element that talking about innovation, I think one of the key critical thing in innovation that uh, some companies are facing already is how to develop products that are the right product to be shipped. Because you know, one thing is if you sell online, and one thing if you sell in the shop. And I'm not talking about the finished product itself, but it's all around what everything is around the product. Now, you guys, by the way, you have this uh, in very interesting way of measuring the, 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 the carbon footprint, right? Yep. Your product. Now, uh, from, a, from an environmental point of view, this COVID thing has been a disaster. Forget the mask, but just think about all the material for the online shipping that has been created and, and the pollution this thing is created. So now I think one of the key innovations, as, as if I were a retailer or a company, is how can I do that more efficiently? So how can I develop type of uh, you know way of delivering a product in a way that is the most efficient possible? Because the existing packaging are not most of the time the most efficient to uh, to be to be shipped. And so I think you know one of the key areas, even more simply, is really how you do that. Mm -hmm. And that's without even thinking about the product itself, but you can talk about you know, sustainability, you can talk about, again, you know, respecting the environment, how can I minimize the, the uh, carbon footprint and all that, which are very relevant benefits, especially for, uh, you know, uh, the younger generation, but I tell you, there's a much higher level of sensitivity also now from, from the older generation. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's difficult to say, oh, you know, this thing is going to work, this thing is not going to work. But I believe, you know, the business model, how you organize the company, uh, how you're going to deliver this online, because, I mean, okay, the fact that it's growing, fine. I mean, I think everybody understands that. The question is, how can a company that was used to have 99.9% of the business through brick and mortar now be able to provide a relevant, you know, experience on, on a situation where probably now it's going to be 50 50. I think 95% of the company won't be able to make it, quite honestly. Yeah. And, and retailers on the other side is how they're going to be able to completely differentiate themselves. I think you know, it's going to be another challenge there, too. Um, I think you know, those, those uh, uh, marketplace platforms, I think, are very, very important. I think if, uh, if there is somebody who's going to develop an architecture, can be a a very interesting business idea to be able to get around. Yeah. And that doesn't impact the category per se. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more about the operational model. You know, we're talking about how you're going to run the company because, okay, COVID is the chief innovation officer, but then you have to make it sustainable. Yeah. And so operation are going to be, you know, very, very relevant. And I think in terms of a, a workload, it's going to be much bigger the focus on this area right now than innovation per se. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, most of those things right now are not going to be sustainable. Yeah, but, but that's a, that's an important that's an important take, and, and I think that's why we don't want to go take that angle to it because we often talk a lot about the the let's say the more visible names, and that is very true because they set the trend. But I, you know, in a country like Italy, actually, a lot of the the retail or the, the, the you know the the, the products that are being created, that are being distributed, that are being sold, are actually coming from more medium-sized companies, right? which actually did not necessarily have the capabilities and, 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 and the readiness for this wave that they actually got engulfed in. Okay. I wonder if you have any questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting. Isabella, do you want to interact with uh, this second contribution by uh, Luca and... Uh, I mean. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. And, uh, oh, sorry, there is a weird echo again. So, uh, thank you very much, Luca and Rabbi. Yes, um, yes, I, I wanted to touch on the um, what you were talking about uh, um, related to the fact that uh, people are actually rediscovering um, neighborhoods. In, uh, in Italy and you know some interesting data in this sense uh, are talking about the fact uh, some of the formats particularly in grocery retail or the bigger formats are actually decreasing importantly uh, in terms of market share um, and the pandemic for example for hypermarkets has uh, actually uh, let's say speed up uh, this uh, this process and we 
we see hypermarkets, uh, for example, really suffering, uh, while at the same time, uh, this becomes a, a huge opportunity for small retailers, as you uh, were saying uh, earlier on. Uh, other than that, uh, really interesting interactions and uh, really good points. And I was wondering if uh, we have other questions from uh, uh, from the audience and if uh, Olivia or Crystal, um, do you have... Uh, no, we don't have questions at, at this point. No, I think we don't have questions for the moment, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you want to ask questions, don't hesitate. You you can ask uh, your question on the chat that you have on the platform. We're well, just watching, looking, no question for the moment. Nothing comes. No, I, I think your, your contributions were quite exhaustive. Ah, yes. What do you think of the bulk market? Is it increasing or not in, uh, in Italy because of the pandemic? The bulk market, the bulk assortment. Okay, so more in terms of wholesale. Yeah. What's the bulk market? Ah, the bulk market. Bulk, yeah. Look, I mean, the, it's funny because uh, I was. Uh, uh, I mean, I shouldn't talk about age. In the US, it's not legal. But anyway, I'm, I'm almost 59. And I was 23 when I started working. And uh, again, you know, many years ago, people were talking that the retail and wholesalers, more retailers and wholesalers were going to be dead in five years or whatever. And 35 years after, I think, you know, still the situation is, uh, is more or less where it was. Um, I believe, uh, uh, you know, the habits are very hard to change. Uh, in consumer mind, definitely, you know, the online is uh, creating uh, this change, which was pushed through the, pandem the pandemic, the compression that we that we mentioned. But clearly, there are areas uh, where, because of uh, uh, the low returns of investing uh, on a structure that allows efficiency in in, uh, in the e-commerce, I think there is still space for a while. Um, you know, I think it's going to be I don't know if it's called integrated e-commerce uh, on and off uh, channels, whatever. I think you know there are areas really where this thing is going to last for a long time. I don't believe it's going to grow. I think it's going to decrease because some of the wholesaling uh, now is has been taken off by by higher level of uh, of e-commerce. Uh, but I mean there are niches uh, that you know areas where still you know south. A lot of big area of the south are still really big shares is in the hand of uh, of all sales. So I believe you know probably what's going to happen they're going to become more and more specialized on spe specific areas uh, because clearly you cannot compete with somebody that has everything. You know the everything store is going to be complex to beat, but maybe you focus on more local, more specific, more typical products. I mean I think you know Italy is one of the most under leveraged country in terms of uh, of. Uh, pushing what we have in terms of, uh, you know, special business. It's, um, I mean, French people are much better than us in marketing everything, you know, starting from wine. Uh, and so I think that's uh, that's my feeling, but I mean, I don't know what... Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think clearly uh, I share your opinion. I, I, I don't see an increase and because I don't see basically the drivers for an increase. And so it's, there's definitely going to be some decrease. Uh, however, you know, I do not think that this thing will disappear anytime soon. Um, but the drive is going to go towards specialization, you know, verticalization. Uh, absolutely. There is another question which, which is not specifically retailing oriented, but Sergio asked if the real estate market in big cities like Milan or Big Turin in Italy is suffering because of the pandemic. It, it, that, that, that's an interesting question, actually. And that's quite an interesting question. In, 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 in Italy, you have to consider it under several angles, which are not just driven by the pandemic. Uh, for instance, if you look at a you know places like Milan, so the real estate market actually is is kind of booming, uh, you know, and it has been booming all along. Now, is that driven uh, by COVID or by the pandemic? Difficult to say. However, you have other things basically that the the governments have been taking. In order to incentivize, for instance, uh, expats to come back, you know, uh, there is a, a massive shift, basically, of Italian expats uh, coming back from the UK, coming back, for instance, to, to Italy. One of the main hubs will be a place like Milan, 
uh, and the kind of incentives basically that are put by the governments. And we're talking about 50 to 70 percent less taxes for five to ten years. But they are conditioned. They are conditioned also on the real estate market, meaning if you buy, you can get that. So actually, you have a uh, maybe indirect effects of the COVID, which governments are trying to bring back extra, bring back basically direct investments into the country that are pushing uh, real estate. Now, is that going to be pushed in a, in a consistent way across the, the country? country? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, but and also, you know, there is a difference, I think, between residential and commercial. Correct. You know, uh, and I think uh, the, you know, I just was, I think both of us, we just was like, <laughs> by the way, because of that, you know, mostly because of, uh, of that uh, situation, because basically you have, a, you know, procrastination of five additional year of, uh, of tax credit. Uh, but the reality is that you know, if you look at the retailers, for example, uh, and you go in the center of Milan, you see many, many empty places. Uh, and if you go to I live in the center of Rome, I have a house in the center of Rome. I mean, you have full streets that were you know buzzing with shops that now are shut down. Uh, what's going to happen there? I don't know because uh, the reality is that uh, from a normal retailing point of view. Uh, it's going to be very hard because apparently they didn't lower the rent uh, overall. Uh, in the office, what's going to happen? Are they going to keep the same price, or are they? And they, you know, maybe it's going to be an hybrid. I don't believe in uh, working from home. I think no. working from home can be used uh, in certain cases, but I mean, you know, it's very hard to to have a, bit, a setup of a team. You know, working, you know, without even getting to know each other, the learning is going to be much slower. I mean, I'm not a big believer of remote you, working. You, I mean, you, you don't it's, think it's going to be a boom after the pandemic because of the experience during? Look, I mean, you know, it depends from where you start. I mean, if you take Milan, the prices were pretty high already. So the question is, it's going to be higher, lower? I don't know. I do, I do believe there's going to be a certain return to normality. Even Google is asking now to people say, look, you know, you have to come back to the office. Which is, uh, you know, I think is a big, uh, is a big uh, thing to, to see. Uh, I, you know, I, I think the big impact is going to be on a lower income. You, this pandemic has generated many new poor, you know, and basically has been crushing the middle class. Uh, so those people are the ones that are impacting, you know, the middle, lower end tier of, uh, of real estate. Commercially, honestly, and from office point of view, I have no clue what's going to happen. Because yeah. there's a lot of space. There are a lot of banks, by the way, that have a lot of estates. What they're going to do with this thing, I have no clue. Unless somebody comes up with some brilliant idea uh, of how to utilize those spaces, I don't know. But, but, but I think when you get to your, to your point and to Sergio's uh, question, I mean, you know, we try to answer it, they probably will give some kind of an answer. But I think what we learned from this pandemic is that the, the make or break for a lot of companies Mm -hmm. is really going to be by exploring the beyond the obvious. You know? uh, yes, there are trends, yes, there are innovations, but there are a lot more question marks than answers at this point in time. And it's going to require you know, a certain phase of trying to understand what is beyond the obvious, what is beyond the first answers, and try to play. And, you know, and, and it's going to be a, a matter of who can experiment and who can you know, challenge the traditional thinking and the conventional thinking more in order to be able to capture the opportunities or fend off the threats. And what about uh, with real estate for the retailing sector? Do you think that because of the pandemic, the, the leasing costs are going to decrease, mainly in big cities, where everywhere in the UK, in the country, the, they are very... The commercial centers are basically, you know, I don't want to say dying, but I mean, commercial centers are for sure eat very severely. Um, they were already struggling before. I mean, again, I think overall this idea of having huge surfaces with many, many shops are struggling everywhere. I mean, I live in China. It's one of, even in China now, they are kind of slowing down uh, because, I mean, that was the big thing at the beginning. But uh, again, you know, if it's a brand new city, maybe they are going there. But overall, it's going to be a much more selective way of, of building those things. I mean, again, the question is, if you are going to transform the shop, into a more experience-based type of uh, uh, situation. I think, you know, luxury, probably they want to they wanna keep some of those flagship stores because that part of the overall equation of the experience, the shopping experience, the personalized, 
uh, experience you had, um, you know. Uh, but for a regular shop, I think it's going to be in some cases some uh, some location that you know where they want to communicate some brand equity and some kind of a uh, uh, connectivity with customer, but. Uh, with the cost they have, it's very hard to imagine that's going to be a boom in that area. Yeah, and, 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 and maybe, uh, you know, uh, Luca and Olivier, just to, to, to maybe give a different perspective on this. Um, what we have seen to date is we have not seen any decrease in the leasing costs or rental costs in, 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 lower, in, in, lower. in Italy. That has not been observed. They are shutting down shops, but they are not lowering the, exactly. the, the rent. Exactly. That's what's happening. And, 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 and probably you know, the role of the store had already been actually put under question. Uh, you know, what is the role of the store, more experiential, all of that. Uh, and that is going to lead basically to some transformation in that end. However, there is a tension there. Because what we do see is the concept of hypermarkets, as you rightfully said, the concept of commercial centers, the way we had experienced them before, that is decreasing. You know, that was under, you know, uh, under pressure, right? exactly under pressure. But that might actually uh, create a need for some of the smaller real estate yeah. in those names to create that proximity uh, stores. Uh, let's remember, I think, whilst at some point in time we went towards a centralization of commerce stores, exactly. Is exactly. It's always a, you know, a pendulum. Mm -hmm. Now what we might actually start experiencing is that decentralization, uh, and that actually might end up creating the new types of stores, smaller stores, different function, and we take that real estate space that might be actually In some now. cases, I have that, I don't know if that's true, but because, I mean, again, I'm not a logistic expert, but in some cases, I'm, I'm hearing, for example, again, I'm living in the central Rome, uh, and there is a kind of rumor that uh, in a building very close to us where they're shutting down all bunch of, of stores, there's going to be a, a, an Amazon warehouse. Uh, now, I don't know if that's, uh, that's true or not, but I mean, probably for certain high value items, the fact to have a centralized location is going to be, I mean, they know better than me mm -hmm. how to calculate the cost, but uh, apparently it looks like that, you know, to have real estate uh, well located in terms of uh, uh, you know, warehousing, storing, or whatever, it's uh, it's another potential item, um, you know, impacting. But at this point in time, you know, landowners are just saying, we don't lower the rent, and I mean, you see also in Milan, central, yeah. some central location, you know, the quadrilateral, you know, with closed shop, which... Good. We have a question maybe to Isabella. Uh, Isabella, you, you explained a lot that during the pandemic, a lot of people of shoppers, they have discovered e-commerce, mainly for food as well. And the question yeah. is, what is the most important about e-commerce? Is it the, the, the um, efficiency of the website or the service delivered by the e-commerce provider? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, it's a mix of the, I, I would say it's a, it's a mix of the two. And uh, I, I actually believe that now a good uh, uh, website experience it's kind of expected it's something it's the basics for retailers so as soon as you go online you expect that your interaction as a user with the website is going to be smooth you're going to navigate the website easily and uh, find uh, uh, really the things that you're looking for and uh, the, the 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 product you're looking for in a very easy and intuitive way. Uh, the differentiating point at the moment uh, for uh, e-commerce and uh, e-retailers uh, is definitely in the service they provide. And by service, I mean uh, the delivery, of course. Uh, we have Amazon that, of course, has set extremely high standards for other um, other retailers. Um, Everywhere. But uh, deliveries. Yeah, everywhere, exactly. So you have to compete with this and we expect now to get our our stuff delivered in a day or even less if you live in one of the big cities in Italy. But it's not just about uh, that type of service to deliver, it's also about um, tailoring the experience, uh, um, inspiring your uh, customers, uh, providing recommendation based on data that you might have about them or data that you collect about them through the website. Um, another important differentiating point, differentiating point uh, it's related to the type of payment you are offering to customers. And for example, delayed payment is something that is really rising also in Italy, where if we think about you know, our heritage and uh, the fact that we are not really keen on 
credit so we really prefer as a culture to to buy everything in one go uh this is an interesting shift and uh, services um like for example after pay and uh, services like that that allow you to um get your payments through different installment installments are actually rising also in italy and emerging there so uh really i i think the differentiation the differentiation point for the online experience lies in the service, but with this um, broader idea. I, I don't know if uh, Luca and Rabin um, agree with me or you have anything else to, to add to this. No, uh, absolutely. Isabella. The, what is the market share of Amazon in Italy for the whole retail sector? In France, it's very low. It's 1.5%. At the top of my head, I can't recall. So, guys, don't let me tell me because I just came back, so I have no idea how big it is, and I haven't seen any data on that. But also, because again, if you measure before and you measure after um, the pandemic, don't forget that you know we just get out of the lockdown, oh. and again, so I think it's gonna take you know this year to understand where we are. Yeah, I, I think Olivier, the, the one thing uh, you know what we try to keep in mind also for our customers when we talk about a player like Amazon and, and market share is Amazon is not I mean it's a retailer of everything. Mm -hmm. So the market share basically on food might be driving uh, let's say the market share a little bit less, but if you may take books for instance, the market yeah. share could be yeah. a lot a lot higher. So they have different market shares, uh, let's say that, that that are that are playing around. Um, what we have seen actually is a, a boom for Amazon in, in, in Italy actually during the pandemic that is quite exceptional. Mm. No, you are right. It's absolutely clear that we must break down the type of the category of product because the supply chain constraint compared with the willingness to pay by the customers is not the same. And it's much higher for uh, specialty products, specialty goods, lifestyle products, much more than for uh, the food. And in France, they decided, they decided Amazon decided to, to quit the, the, the food because it's too, uh, it's too costly and the, the, it's not profitable at all. Yeah. So they Actually, said, it's the opposite in Italy. Uh, yeah, for that matter, it's the opposite in Italy uh, for Amazon because Amazon is truly booming there. For instance, Estelunga, which is the let's say the, the high end uh, big store, yeah. high end historical let's say retail chain in Italy. Amazon actually is bidding for buying it now. So on the contrary, actually Amazon is expanding its presence also because up until now the main uh, let's say uh, geographies in the world where Amazon had started creating their own direct brands or, or, or buying like Whole Foods and a lot of that were mainly in the U.S. But the second place where we're seeing actually that kind of activity is in Italy now, because they're quite aggressively uh, trying to buy a, a, a number of pretty large and iconic retailers. Yeah, yeah. but it's more it's digital strategy. They are doing that with partnership with uh, existing retailers, not by uh, itself. It's not pure online e-commerce. No, 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 it's not no, the same. Yeah, but pure. Yeah, I mean, uh, for example, a huge growth has been in all the appliances. You know, if you think about cooking and all that, I mean, there's been a huge boom. I mean, if you think about the longi, the longi went from 11 euros to 35 euros, and most of the growth was driven by online sales. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. It's more digital strategies, uh, copying, doing that with uh, partners, physical brick and mortar retailers, much more than pure online uh, e-commerce for food because it's definitely difficult. And we have in France. We have 30% of, uh, of failure in delivering. In the, the, the people, they order, they select the slot, the time slot, and they are not there. So yeah. they have to, to get back, and all that is very expensive for them. And it's very difficult supply chain, very difficult to reach and to access the, the shoppers, the e-shoppers, because the, the cities are more and more complicated in terms of traffic, traffic jam, yeah. green cities, all that. It's, Oh, a lot of constraints for uh, for pure e-commerce for food, and because the willingness to pay by the shoppers is very low, and it's much lower than for uh, lifestyle products, so yeah. um, the 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 optimum is very difficult to reach. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely, and, and, and it's important that you raise that point of digital because I think you know uh, 
ventricle is the key because we, we can no longer think of even even you know I mean we, we talk about it from a unified commerce kind of perspective but, but I think it's just going to be the basic that's it uh, you know it is absolutely the basic the basic thing you know um, I think we don't have any additional questions so I think it's time to acknowledge and thank you so much dear colleagues Isabella, Luca, Rabi, for your contributions. It was very interesting, and we are delighted and honored to have uh, one month out of two, each, each two months, a uh, contribution for the other campuses of the school. But at the same time, we are delighted to receive a colleague from the Bocconi uh, School. I worked, I've been working a lot with Professor Banarkova, who is a very famous professor at the Bocconi University. So thank you very much for, for coming. And uh, the next meeting, will be from Paris this time. So it's going to be in uh, in June, June the 3rd. I think it's a Thursday. And uh, by the way, the topic will be supply chain and urban supply chain and unified commerce. And we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Uh, retailing is very, of course, it's very consumer oriented. It's a lot of experience and shopping experience, but mostly it's economics and logistics. And uh, yeah. I think it's what we've seen during the pandemic, and I guess in Italy as well, so that we have, we've seen an increase of demand for e-commerce because of the lockdown, because of all the, the, all the, 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 the issues with the, the brick and mortar stores. But it's not because the demand is increasing that maybe it will be uh, more profitable in the future. So the, the supply chain issues and profitability of the supply chain for for low cost and discount products remains a key issue and we try to address that during this next breakfast. It's going to be an e-breakfast June the 3rd. Thank you so much to the participants, the attendees, the speakers and uh, see you next time. And Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Have a, Have a good evening everyone. Thank you to the Tur Turin campus and to Bearing Point uh, Italian teams. Bye-bye. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.